welcome to Google. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, so uh, saw it. It's <coughs> phenomenal. Uh, it comes out on February 23rd um, globally. And so uh, we're super excited. Um, so this is based on a novel. Um, and so by Jeff uh, Vandermeer's uh, trilogy, Southern Reach. Um, so I want to talk about a little bit about when was your first time when you discovered the book or read the book and uh, what attracted you to it? Uh, it? It was sent to me by um, uh, a producer. I just worked with him on this movie, Ex Machina, and um, uh, I was in post-production, uh, so editing and so on of Ex Machina. He sent me a book and he said, uh, you should take a look at this. And um, I read it and, uh, and I sort of decided as I was reading it that I'd like to give it a try at adapting it. Um, uh, it had two particular things. It's, it's genuinely original as a book and that is unusual in itself because uh, most stories that we encounter in literature and in cinema and in television are, are actually repeats of stories that we tell ourselves again and again and again for whatever reason. It's like a form of reassurance or uh, a, a ritual that we need or enjoy or something. And this wasn't like that. It just stepped outside it completely. So first off, it was original. And it also had a very, very powerful, strange atmosphere. The, the reading of the book is a little bit like having a dream. And um, uh, that was also very unusual. It presented a lot of issues in terms of how you adapt it. I've worked on adaptations before uh, where you have a certain kind of narrative that you're almost cutting and pasting the narrative. Uh, and uh, this, I couldn't see how it would function like that, but the thing that attracted me to it was true originality and this crazy, dreamy, trippy atmosphere. Right, and um, you know, you, you wrote your novel, The Beach, back in the 1990s, a long, and then, time, a ago, long yeah. time ago, and it was adapted into uh, a film. So what was your experience like now kind of on the reverse? So you had your book adapted into a film, and now you're adapting a book. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it, that was 20-something years ago. Mm -hmm. It was a long time ago. And I've been working in film. I basically stopped writing books, and I started writing films and working in film. Um, over that period of time, I'd done, I think, three adaptations uh, as films that got made at any rate. Um, one was Never Let Me Go, uh, which was an adaptation of a book. One was Dread, which was an adaptation of a British uh, comic strip character called Judge Dread from a sort of anthology series called 2000 AD. And then there was this, Annihilation, that was the third one. And in each case, it was different. Never Let Me Go, very or almost slavish adaptation of the book. Um, uh, Dread uh, is like a set in a big sci-fi world. I work in a low budget arena. I can't really do that stuff. So I was faithful to the character. It was an adaptation of the character. And in this instance, it was like an adaptation of the atmosphere, I would say, broadly. Uh, that's, that's very broad. What was it like? It was really, really hard. I mean, it was seriously <laughs> difficult. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, that's okay. That's um, that's the job. What about Jeff Vandermeer? So the you know the original author of the book. Did, did you work with him? Did you get any advice from him? Did you clear had to clear anything with him, or did he kind of say yeah, kind of do what you definitely yeah. because because <laughs> having having written novels years ago and had them adapted uh, and really what I am is a writer. That, that I, when I think of what my job is, I'd say I'm a writer. And so I, f I feel an affinity with the writer of the book and a kind of duty uh, to them. And what I said to Jeff was, I'm not going to, I was upfront. I said, I'm not going to be able to do a beat by beat adaptation of this because I don't know how to do it. Somebody else might be able to do it, but it's not me. And so, in a, in a sense, partly what I needed from Jeff was his blessing, his permission. And then I wrote a screenplay and I showed it to him. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's crazy because it have how many of you guys read the book? Have people read the original? Yeah. Oh, and cool. the book is um, I had just read it and I was because the characters don't have names, they just go by kind of their occupation. That's right. And Biologist, surveyor, psychologist. Right. And so um didn't and do that in the film. Well obviously right. Yeah, yeah you need character names, especially when well, they're college they're out. You don't need them, but uh, what I figured was um, if you didn't have names because we use names when we're talking to each other. And if you completely avoided that in a film, it might feel arch, you know? 
it, it might feel like an affectation. And in a book, it, it, I think because it's such a sort of internal first person book, it, it, it doesn't matter and it's actually kind of cool. But in a film, I didn't, I didn't want it to feel mannered in that way, yeah. so I just gave them names. And so uh, Ex Machina, um, which you worked on before this, it was your first directorial debut. Um, what did you take away or learn from that film as a director that you brought over to this film? What, what was easier for nothing. you? Or nothing, <laughs> nothing at all, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, basically, any way the job never changes. I, I, I find myself repeating this again and again, but it's because of, I think it's the way we perceive film, which is as a pyramid structure, and at the top of the pyramid is a director. And it's, it's just not my personal experience of filmmaking. Um, uh, I don't really like pyramid structures anyway, I have to say, they're not, they're not my scene. But um, uh, I, I would see it more like a mountain range. A mountain range with a kind of parallax effect happening. So sometimes one mountain feels more prevalent than another and then you shift your perspective and everything's different. Um, and uh, that has always been the case. At different times in the process, in development, shooting, post-production, the parallax is shifting. That didn't change before Ex Machina, after. Um, and, and the truest way I can say it is that it's a collective. Uh, I work in a collective and it's a group of people, some of them I've worked with for 20 years. Uh, some people come in new and then they have to learn the vibe of, of how the collective works together. Um, I'm not saying this is lip service, it's literally true. Uh, uh, it's, it's something like a version of anarchy, uh, it, it's, but it's not anarchy as chaos, it's anarchy where you have uh, a collective of autonomous bodies who are all working towards the same goal and uh, that, that's the sort of methodology. Um, so I never sort of quote unquote coax a performance out mm -hmm. of an actor. The actor is responsible for their performance. After we do a lineup, a, a rehearsal, and all the crew comes in to see what the blocking looks like, uh, I then turn to the DOP and I don't say put a camera here and put that lens on it and move it like this. I say, how do you want to shoot it? And, and that is the whole process the whole way through. Wow. And um, so you talked about you know working with a lot of the same people and, and, and kind of building up your crew. You worked with Oscar Isaac on Ex Machina, yep. and you brought him back for this. So what was? Um, he came how, back. Or he came back, I guess, for it. Um, what was? Uh, when did you guys meet, and what kind of wanted you to to recast him again? In this just a good partner. Uh, we met in Ex Machina, um, mm -hmm. trying to find the right cast, and Oscar is uh, a bunch of things. Um, you know, part of what I'm saying, part of what I just said before, relies on like-minded people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if you're not going to fit into that vibe, it's not going to work. Um, and uh, Oscar fits into that very naturally because he's a very self-possessed actor. Um, he, he thinks about it on his own, he comes to a conclusion, he arrives between takes, he varies the takes. Um, he says, I want to try it like this, and then he tries it like that. So it's partly that, he's just a flat out brilliant actor. He's very self-possessed. He's also a good guy to have around. He's very witty. He's got a fantastic sense of humor. He's kind of relaxed. Um, like what's not to like? Yeah, no, he, he's, he's phenomenal. He's phenomenal in this. He's, he's phenomenal in Ex Machina. And you have an incredible cast with Natalie Portman mm -hmm. and who plays lead, Junior Rodriguez, Tessa Thompson, um, Jennifer Jason Lee. And so... And Tuva Novotny is also a brilliant <laughs> Swedish actor. Yeah, no, and, and it's it's a phenomenal, phenomenal cast. So when you're casting your lead and you're kind of looking at the characters in the book and then you're trying to adapt that to, to what your vision is, where, how did you land on, especially with Natalie being the lead, how did you find her and, and what qualities did she bring to that where you're like, this is, this is my Lena? What, what Natalie has as an actor is uh, she's got these two concurrent things going on at the same time. One of them is an enormous amount of poise. Um, She's, she's kind of, a, she is a powerful presence in her behavior, in the way she looks, in the sort of aura around her and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about, I'm primarily talking about in terms of performance um, because obviously that's the thing that is on the screen and that's what you're looking for. But she also has something else, uh, which is she has the ability to demonstrate damage between the cracks and 
So as well as having all of these actually rather intimidating features, uh, there's something she can tap into which is broken and uh, um, explosive uh, and, and kind of wild. Um, and so there's a sort of subversion inside her and that made her exactly right for this particular character. Yeah, and she's absolutely phenomenal. The entire cast is just so well well casted and, and so well chosen and phenomenal. And the movie is just, it's crazy weird. We talked about this a little bit, where it's just, it's really weird. It's a mind-numbing thing, and it's phenomenal. Like, it's so, so, so freaking good. Cool, man. Right? Um, nice. Where was was there any kind of no? But was there any kind of like no? It is it's it's, it's phenomenal. But like, what, was there any inspiration in terms of the story? Because it did change from the novel. Where did you kind of pull from in terms of was this a story you were resting on for a while, no. or did it just kind of evolve as you were writing it? There, there was two things. I think always when I'm working, there's something that's obsessing me for some reason mm -hmm. or another. Uh, and in this case, it was about self destruction. Um, I, I, I had this kind of thing that I'd become uh, aware of, uh, or I believe I'd become aware of, which was that um, uh, everyone I know, uh, and I would speculate everybody in the room at the moment, uh, is self-destructive. And um, you meet some people and their self-destruction is very apparent. They almost offer it up to you. Uh, they're an alcoholic, they're a heroin addict, they keep uh, committing crimes, they're recidivist or whatever it is, and, and you can see it. It's, it's sort of demonstrated. And then you also meet people who are very confident, comfortable in their own skin, they've got a great job, they earn a lot of money, they have a fantastic family, and you feel always slightly on the back foot because those people are intimidating and you also feel that they have cracked life in some kind of way, they've cracked it. And then if you become very close to one of those people, you discover odd fissures here and there and you discover very strange bits of meaningless self-destructive behavior. And it was the meaninglessness of the self-destructive behavior that I found interesting. And uh, people are the, you know, even the sort of supernaturally uh, prepossessed person is is sort of dismantling their job, or they're dismantling a friendship, or they're dismantling their marriage, and uh, and and so that became the kind of fixation that was overlaid onto this film. It is basically a film about self-destruction, and it has a kind of thesis within it about why we do that, um, and uh, and the, the various forms in which it takes, I suppose. Um, and then in terms of overlaying that onto Jeff's really beautiful novel, uh, which is about another kind of destruction, more eco, the planet, um, uh, I thought reading this book is like a dream. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to adapt it like a dream. I'm, I'm not going to reread the book. I'm going to adapt it from my memory of the book. Hmm. and. Uh, and in a way that was what Jeff gave me permission to do. So in some places it will correlate very closely, and in other places it won't. Um, Could you tap into that feeling that you got from the book versus just how... It's a dream story. response yeah. to a dream book, right. kind of. And, uh, and, it, and it's an interesting thing as well, because then it becomes about the nature of memory, I think, to an extent as well. I, years and years ago, I was watching some TV show and there was a cop talking about eyewitnesses and he said eyewitnesses are useless. Like, forget about, everyone thinks an eyewitness is the best thing you can have in solving a crime, but it's like the worst. And, and what you need is empirical evidence, fingerprints and DNA and stuff like that. And he was saying, someone runs into uh, a restaurant and there's a violent crime and someone's killed and one eyewitness will say he had a gun, shot five times, another one will say shot once, another one will say there wasn't a gun, it was a knife. And you, you, you can't really rely on memory. And actually in my life, I've often observed that's true. Um, and uh, so it was sort of a, making that application of that, that thing about subjectivity, I suppose, to, uh, to this story. And so it's, it's a beautiful film, beautifully shot, and the set design stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about that in terms of where was it shot, how did you expand upon using practical effects and practical set design versus CG? Uh, where it was shot, so, 
So one of the things about this movie was to make everything off, you know? Kind of. It starts in a suburban setting and it ends in a psychedelic setting. It's a suburbia to psychedelia story. And uh, so the offness, how you get the quality of offness was, was an important part of it. And um, uh, so what we did was we, uh, rather than shoot it, it's notionally set somewhere on a coastal part of North America, Florida-ish, right? Um, and we could have shot it in Northern Florida, we could have shot it in Louisiana, it's got a good tax break and all that kind of thing. Um, uh, but we ended up shooting it in England, just outside London, and we dressed an English forest to look kind of like a distorted version of a North American bit of Southern, southern North American coastline. And f in the hope it would give us some of the otherness we were looking for, uh, a rightness and a wrongness. And I think it, I, you know, I kind of think it did. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. Um, when you are um, working with scenes like that and stuff, because it's a very complicated film, there's a lot going on. There are monsters, I guess I could call or animals, uh, yeah, evolved yeah. Mo uh, animals. And um, so when you're working with that, was there any, what was the most, I guess, difficult scene that you had to work with or get right um, uh, or film, challenging? The, the film got progressively more difficult because there's a kind of contract that is in a way made with the audience at the beginning of the film, which is that this is gonna end in a strange place. And creating strangeness in a film is complicated. Um, partly because like Jeff's novel, it has to be original. Um, and so we had to find out where we source that strangeness, and that, that, that was part of the question. And also, strangeness itself has a kind of diminishing return. So if you start a story strange and end it strange, by the time you get to the end, you're kind of acclimatized to the strangeness, and it's actually lost the quality that you specifically wanted at the end. So uh, hence suburbia, mm -hmm. starting in a suburban setting and, and progressively giving a film a nudge forward into a more and more hopefully earned uh, hallucin uh, hallucinogenic kind of state. Okay, um, and we're going to take audience questions in just a few minutes. If you guys want to, there's a mic there, if you want to stand there and just make sure you flip it on. Um, but uh, when you are, um, when you're obviously crafting the film and you're shooting it and again the editorial, was there anything that you had to cut for time or for pacing that you wished that you could have kept in it? Or no. was everything was in there that you wanted no. to? Uh, the, the, Part of the job is making sure that the end cut, the end thing, is the thing that the collective was working towards and being respectful of that. And uh, that can involve uh, conflict sometimes, but, um, uh, but you've got to stay true to the thing that you intended to do. And um, uh, so nothing is on the cutting room floor that should have been in there, and nothing's in there that shouldn't be in there. As a collective, we we are judged on the final product, so you better respect the final product right. and do it the way you meant to. Right. And uh, were there any directors or films, kind of, when you were growing up, that helped kind of inspire you to become the director that you are, or the writer that you are as well? Loads. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Um, uh, the first film that ever made a really strong impact on me was probably Apocalypse Now. Um, uh, I also love the first Alien movie. I think it's just an incredibly beautifully constructed, intelligent bit of filmmaking and, and subversive as well. I think I like films that are subversive. Yeah. You know, I, I like things that work within genre and then fuck with the genre yeah. uh, in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned kind of the anarchic uh, uh, environment that you work in when you make your films. Does that uh, bleed into when you write, or is writing totally solo? Uh, and then my second question is, now that you've done writing, directing, and both, do you have a preference? Uh, no preference. I think it's the same job, basically. And in terms of the solo aspect, yeah, you start writing on your own, you do. Uh, one of the first surprises I had with writing, actually, I've been doing it about 25 years, and one of the first surprises, this sounds like a stupid thing to say, but I realized you never get promoted. Like, <laughs> there, there, there's no ladder you, you move up, because it always begins with a blank page. And uh, that was sort of a shock, 
bizarrely. You know, I thought something would happen, um, but it doesn't. Um, so, so you you start on your own, but it then it then stops and it becomes part of the collective for various reasons. One is that the script is effectively parceled out to different departments, production design and wardrobe and VFX and special effects and all, all that kind of stuff. And all of those people are bringing their interpretation to it. Also what happens is actors get involved and you are not the possessor of the character anymore when the actor becomes involved. It's actually their character. And what I've found with good actors, and this is true across the board, hence the collective, right, is that they, they make it better, they elevate it. They, they do things you just didn't think of. And the, the first movie I ever worked on, the, for, no, the first one I ever wrote was a zombie movie, 28 Days Later. And there was an actor in it, Brendan Gleeson. And when he was doing the lines, I kept hearing things that I had not intended or thought of or known about, and I realized right from the get-go what, what a good actor can do, you know? And so, uh, so yes, it begins on your own, but it then really becomes like everything else in the film, which is part of a big conversation amongst the autonomous units. Did you go into writing wanting to be a director, or did you just... Did that just come and like happen? Like it, it you, just happened. Yeah. I, I didn't I didn't start writing wanting to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I, like none of it was intentional. Um, uh, I was a backpacker. I started writing about backpacking. That turned into a book. The book got made into a film. I thought, hang on a minute. You don't have to sit in a room on your own the whole time. You can be with a bunch of other people. Then I was working on films, and then uh, gradually. Uh, I, in a funny way, I actually became a director to sort of get rid of the director, in truth, <laughs> just, just, just for the absence of the director. Uh, I've noticed personally that I tend to enjoy films and TV shows where the writer and director are one and the same. And so I'm curious, your perspective, when you fill both roles, what, what advantage does that give you? Or maybe inversely, if you're only doing one of the two, what handicaps? And what, why is it that a powerful combination in your mind? Um, I think, I mean, uh, immediately my brain starts filling with directors who are terrific who don't write. But well, I, I take your point. And, um, uh, I think what it is, is that in the end, probably the most useful thing that you can do on set is to be able to answer a question. So somebody is puzzled over why this bit of motivation is happening or why this thing should look like that or whatever it happens to be, which happens to all of us, right? You, you are confused about why you're doing the thing you're doing. And if you are in the position of writing and directing, you're in a very good position to offer your opinion, an informed opinion. Now, that doesn't have to get observed, but it does mean you can say something from a position of some uh, personal knowledge. And, uh, and I think that in, in and amongst the talents, it's useful to have someone as a sounding board. And, and I think that often what my job is on a day-to-day -day level is being someone you can have a conversation with. It, it may be that, but, but then I'll tell you another word. Just, there's no cookie cutter, right? And one thing I've learned is that you never know how a film is made. Whatever the credits say at the end, you never know how a film is made unless you worked on that film. And, and the processes with one group are not the processes with another. And so, you know, different ball game with other people. That's just me. Hi. Uh, I'm going to bring it back to Annihilation for a second, because um, I was introduced to Annihilation and the Southern Reach trilogy via the trailer, the teaser when I saw it, and I just was blown away and was like, what is this thing? And so I read all the books very sequentially, and there's a little bit of unresolvedness, not only about the first one, but about all of them in general. And I love that you said the dream state and then your dream of that is what I was drawn into. And I'm curious to know how the other two either play into this they or don't. don't at all. They it's don't kind of, all. they don't touch it in any way. They, they, they really don't. I mean, it's partly because Jeff was writing the trilogy he was still actually writing it while I was writing the screenplay for the first. 
but it's not it's not just that I mean that's just sort of factually the state of affairs but it's also because I I don't want to work on uh, franchises um, I I have no judgment for people who do it is a completely personal position and it, and it doesn't stem from anything about the nature of franchises or sequels or anything like that it's because at the end of a three-year process I know of myself already I will not want to work on it again <laughs> that's it thank you Alex um, you touched on this a little bit about the idea of having this thesis uh, in your in your films, uh, especially in this one that you, you touched on. Um, how early does that come out in your writing process? Do you start with a thesis or do you sometimes discover it during the process? And if you could just maybe take us through the beginnings of a, of a story for your, how, how you start thesis. with it. It starts with a thesis. Um, it, it'll be some particular thing that I have started to get obsessed with and I'm thinking about it in a repetitive, compulsive way. It's, it's not really an intellectual process, it's a compulsive process. And uh, um, in, in the case of Annihilation, it was uh, uh, self-destruction and uh, this, the odd qualities of self-destruction and the odd places in which you find it. And in the thing I'm working on at the moment, uh, it was a principle uh, called determinism, uh, a sort of product of living in a physical universe of cause and effect and uh, some of the implications of that to do with free will and, uh, and, and what potentially one could predict of actions and uh, that kind of thing. And so I get interested in that. I start to read about it. I start to, uh, I start to obsess. And then at some point, not intentionally, a narrative arrives that inevitably is dovetailed to the thing I'm obsessed about at that moment. And it's another reason why I don't work on sequels, because, because I want to be interested in something else. And I will be interested in something else, because I've got a limited capacity to, be, to, to know much about anything right? at a certain point. So I feel, OK, I've learned this up to my ability, or I've explored it up to my ability. What's next, kind of? It's not quite as prosaic as that, but it's you know, more or less. Last question. Um, nowadays, I know that original content is so hard to come by. And so uh, for you being a writer and coming up with original um, ideas and stuff like that, are you constantly thinking about you know, what the next original idea is going to be? Or is it just one day something pops into your head and you just you know, go for it? Well, in all honesty, I'm not sure. I think this is one of the reasons I was interested in Jeff's book, is I'm not sure I do come up with original ideas. I'm not sure that's what I do. I, I think I often work within existing ideas and sometimes then use the ability to subvert them or play around with them. Um, uh, so no, I'm not thinking about what is the next original idea. I, I'm, I wouldn't be able to think like that even if I wanted to. Uh, if I think back of the things I've written as spec scripts, so say a film like 28 Days Later or a film like Ex Machina, I can point you towards a lot of zombie movies and I can point you towards a lot of movies that are concerned with artificial intelligence or the nature of sentience or objectification or whatever the, the concern is within the thing. In a way, that's partly why I found the book Annihilation so interesting is because maybe I lack the capacity to do that and Jeff has done that and that, that's, a, that's, a, that's like a honey to a bee, no, nectar. They make honey. <laughs> <laughs> so, some sort of appropriate analogy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to wrap up, uh, as a uh, screenwriter and novelist and, and uh, director, what piece of advice have you received that has been, that's kind of stuck with you over the years? Uh -huh. <laughs> um. The only, <laughs> the first mm -hmm. bit of advice that came into my head was my dad when I was a kid saying, if you think someone's going to hit you, hit them first. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it has 
has that nothing to, do, it's got nothing to do with it. It was more just a general life lesson. I got that. Um, Fair uh, enough. But, uh, so uh, I did, it doesn't apply. It's just the only bit of advice that came into okay. my mind. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. I cannot top that. So thank you so much for uh, being here. Uh, Annihilation comes out uh, February 23rd. Uh, so go watch it. It's phenomenal. Right. So thanks, thanks so much. Cheers. Yep.